Good morning and welcome again to the First Baptist Church of Florence Sunday School. And my name is Tom Grant and I am your teacher. And we were going to be looking and continuing today in the book of Isaiah. And today we have a wonderful lesson. It is from the book of Isaiah chapter 53. And for those of you who may not know, this is the picture about 500 years before it ever happened of Christ dying on the cross. And chapters 53 through 55 in the book of Isaiah talk about that very blessed event. And so we saw God introduce last week his servant of the Lord who would be Jesus Christ that would be to come. And he was assuring the people of Judah that they would one day be brought back. Now there's two bringing backs, if you will. One of them was 70 years after they went into captivity, but the glory of God never returned to the temple during that 70 years. And the other one was the carrying away that happened in AD 70 when Israel was scattered throughout all of the nations of the world as God had promised he would do to her if she did not obey him. And so we are seeing the event that God had promised in the last couple of lessons about there being a servant of the Lord who would come. And this servant of the Lord would do basically two things. Number one was he would regather the nation of Israel. And we for sure see that again today. There was not an Israel from 19, or from AD 7, excuse me, until 1948 when the nation was reformed at the end of World War II. And so God is now regathering his people. And the second was that he would also gather a people from among the Gentile nations, of which we in America are included. So praise God that he has included all the nations of the world. And that was the emphasis of last week's lesson, that all the nations of the world would be able to come to, to God and renew a relationship with him. And so that's what Christ has been doing for the past over 2,000 years, is bringing out a group of people from the Gentile nations called the church. And those people will be gathered together with his people when Christ comes again. Now this week in Isaiah 53, God has, it has last week, let me say, showed us what the servant will do. Now this week he is going to show us how the servant will be able to do that. How can one individual bring from all of the earth millions upon untold millions of people back to God? Well, Isaiah answers that question for us. And so God is, is planning on bringing back all of the peoples from Israel and from Judah back into favor with God through this one servant who is called Jesus Christ. And so from the beginning, God's intention was to save everyone. John 3.16 tells us, and we all know the scripture, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so God gave his son so that all of the world could be saved. Now, before we get into the lesson today, I think it's, it would uh, behoove us to understand the death of the cross. Now, the cross is not a pleasant thing. First of all, it is a death by suffocation. Because when they, when they nailed the prisoners to the cross, they always extended their arms out, but they were also up. And the reason for that is each time that they expelled air out of their lungs, they could not expel all of the air and some carbon dioxide remained. And over a period of hours, the lungs would fill up with carbon dioxide and the person hanging on that cross would begin to slowly die of suffocation. He can't get breath. And then in addition to that, there would be the pain of the nails driven through the hand 
and through the feet. And then in addition to that, there would be the loss of blood, which would bring great shock to the individual. And so this, this was a violent death. It was a cruel death. And it was a long death. In most cases, the people on the cross would last for days and suffer for days before death finally took them. But in Jesus' case, if you remember, when they went to Pilate and told Pilate Jesus is dead, Pilate marveled. He was only on the cross six hours and he's already dead. And he sent the Roman soldiers back to make sure. And so Jesus suffered very heavily on the cross of Calvary. As a, and as another fact that we should understand, um, the Bible had prophesied that not a bone on his body would be broken, but whenever the men were dying on the cross, they were in their last hours, they would come to the cross, the Roman soldiers with the club, and they would break the legs in the bones, uh, the bones in the legs, I'm sorry, so that the individual who would be in that prone position could not raise up with his feet and get a gulp of air, and that would force him to die quicker. So they would break the, the bones in the legs. And if you will remember at the crucifixion of Christ, they came along to do that to him and he was already dead. So there was no need to break the bone and it fulfilled a prophecy of no bone to be broken. So that is the thing that we're talking about today. God is speaking through Isaiah to the land of Judah and the land of Israel, actually. And God wants them to understand that this servant of the Lord that he has been promising will come in the right time and in the right way. And these are the things that he would do in order to be able to call millions of people out of the world back into favor with God. So starting in, in chapter 53 with verses 1 through 3, here's what the Bible says. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant and a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or of majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from, he was despised, and we didn't value him. Now, I want to be honest with you. I like the King James Version of the Bible on, in these sections, but I need to stick with our Sunday School lesson literature, which is a different version, uh, because that's all that most people out there have uh, is your Sunday School books. But the first thing God asked, uh, Isaiah to ask the people is, who is going to believe what I am going to tell you. Who has ever heard of such a thing? One man dying to save millions of people. And so he asked the question of the people. Are you going to believe the things that you're going to hear? I pray that you do. And today in our world, I pray that God will send us to people whose hearts are open and will be willing to believe that report that we might lead some to Christ. And then he says, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Well, the arm of the Lord is the arm of power and strength. It is the right arm. That was the arm of power and strength in the days of Christ. And when armies fought, it was the right arm that was, was the, the one that counted. And Christ today is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Because that's the position of power and that's the position of authority. And so he says, to whom has the arm of the Lord be revealed? And then he starts talking about this servant who is the arm of the Lord and who this is going to be about. He begins to describe him. He says, first of all, he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. Well, the servant will come as a child. He's that tender plant that is planted and then grows up. Now, you see, the Jews are looking for this great, powerful ruler to come suddenly on the scene and restore Israel to everything that she thought she should be. 
But God says, no, he will come as a child. And so the Jewish leaders are saying, what can a child do? A child has no power. A child can't do anything. And so he, God says he will grow up before him like a young plant, and he says like a root out of di dry ground. Okay, there are many parts in the land of Israel that are dry, and they don't get a lot of rain. And so those plant, those cities are basically dry ground. And so he says he will come out of the dry ground of southern Israel. And therefore, we know that Jesus is going to be born in something in Israel, somewhere in Israel. And so he says he will be like a root out of dry ground. If you take a root in dry ground and you water it consistently and, and nourish it, it will grow into a plant. And that's what God says he's going to do with his son or his servant of the Lord. And then verse 5 says he, dis, he didn't have an impressive form of majesty that we should look at him. No appearance that we should desire him. God says, listen, he's not a charismatic person. He is not going to be all handsome and well-dressed. And see, that's what the, Rome, the uh, Jews were looking for. A prince among princes, a ruler among rulers who would suddenly burst on the scene, throw out the Roman army, and that they, they would put Israel, or he would put Israel in power. And so that's what they're looking for. But God says there is nothing that's going to be specially attractive. He's going to look just like any other kid, and he's going to look like any other man. Why? Because he will be God in the body of a man. And so there will be nothing about him that will impress people, and there is nothing in his appearance that would make us desire him. He's not going to be this kind of leader who can just reach out and, and with just speak, spoken words just draw people to him. Rather, he is an ordinary-looking man. He doesn't look any different than anyone else in Israel. And then he goes on and says, he was despised and rejected by men. Men would reject him because that's not the leader they were looking for. The nation would reject him because he's not that prince, that king, that suddenly appears with a bright light and takes over and does everything. He looks like any other man. Therefore, he, they are despised, he is despised and he is rejected of them. And... Of suffering, he knew what sickness was. Now, I'm probably going to say something here that a lot of people will disagree with, and that's okay. I don't have 100% biblical proof of this, but I think that every time Jesus healed someone, I think he took their sicknesses into his body. I really believe that, and I believe because of that, and I believe the cross backs that up when it says, by his stripes we are healed, and, and that he took upon himself our sicknesses. I believe while he was here on earth and he would heal a person of a sickness or a, an illness or a whatever, he would assume that in his body. And I don't expect everyone to agree with that, but that's what I personally believe. And so he was acquainted with sicknesses, and he knew what it was to suffer illness. And he knew what it was to suffer death. His father, Joseph, died early on in the life of Jesus. That's why you don't see Joseph at the cross. That's why you don't see Joseph anywhere in the New Testament other than at the birth of Jesus Christ because Joseph dies early. So he's, he's acquainted with the death of a father as a young child. And he suffers all of these things. And he knew what sicknesses was. And he was like someone people turned away from. He was despised. To be honest with you today, if you met Jesus in Israel in, the, in a modern day situation, he would almost be what we call a street person. He is from a very poor family, born in Bethlehem. He, is, he doesn't have a lot of wealth. He doesn't have a lot of power. He's not anybody that's desirable and, and, and has all of this charisma that will draw people. And yet, he is the Savior of the world. 
And, and if we met him today, he and John the Baptist would be what we call today the homeless, the street people. And Jesus even tells us that. He t some people want to follow him, and he tells them, listen, if you follow me, the Son of Man doesn't have a place to even lay his head. He's a wanderer. And he goes from town to town preaching the gospel of Jesus or of God himself. And so he, there's nothing that someone would want to be with People would turn away from him. And then he goes on and says he was despised. He didn't, we didn't value him. You see, we mankind, and this is so difficult, we only judge by what we see on the outside. But God judges by what he sees in the heart. And so when we would look at his outside appearance, we would think that's the Messiah. That is the one who came to save the world? That can't possibly be true. It can't be this guy. It's got to be a glorious king in power and light and authority and with great uh, preeminence and all of those things. It surely can't be this kid that was raised up down in Bethlehem and then, and then moved to Nazareth and was raised in Nazareth. It cannot be. It's got to be somebody else that we're looking for. And so God tells them very plainly, this is what is going to happen. And he, so he asked in the beginning this question, who will believe this? Who will, who will believe our report? And to whom will the right arm of the Lord be revealed? I mean, it's just absolutely amazing how God performed this plan. But you've got to understand, Jesus had something that nobody else has ever had. He had two natures, the nature of God 100%, and the nature of man 100%. And they are interwoven into one person called Jesus of Nazareth. And so he gives a total description of what it would be like. And this is not, when he comes, that is not what the Jewish people are looking for, and therefore they reject him. Then he says in verses 4 and 5, Yet he himself bore our sicknesses, and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. He was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed uh, because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. Okay, here's the thing about Jesus. On the cross and all during his life, he would take on the illnesses of others. Notice what it says. He bore our sicknesses, okay, and then he carried our pain, he, he felt the pain of death for others so that he could save them and bring them back into a relationship of God. Just think of this. As I've already mentioned, the death of Joseph. He was acquainted with that. He lost a father at a very early age. Secondly, there were people he healed from death. Uh, the, the widow of Canaan, he raised her son. Jarius' daughter, he raised her. He was well acquainted with death, and he knew the sting of death, and he himself would even feel the death. But he was well acquainted with death, and so he carried our pains. But here's what we did. We, in turn, regarded him stricken, struck down by God. When we looked at him, when mankind in that day and time looked at Jesus hanging on the cross, what they looked at was a criminal that was justly dying for the sins of blasphemy by claiming to be the Son of God. And so the people look at him as God has brought justice to him and God has struck him and brought him down because he claimed to be God when he wasn't God. And they did not understand that it would take the death of Jesus the innocent on the cross to save the, the uh, sin, sinner of us today. And always, down through the whole period of time. And then he goes on and he says, he was afflicted. He was, he was afflicted in every way. They beat him. They plucked out his beard. They put the crown of thorns onto his head and drove the thorns into his skull. He was afflicted by mankind. And yet he was going to the cross to save them and die for them. And then he says he was pierced because of our rebellion. Think about that. We rebelled against God 
And Jesus was pierced and died so that our rebellion could give, be forgiven and bring us back into a relationship with God. Remember when he's on the cross, the Roman soldier took a spear and spears his side and out came the blood and the water. He went through the heart and he was pierced in the heart. And then he says, he was crushed for our iniquities. Now the word crushed here is talking about what they call a wine press. They had a wine press and they would take the, the grapes from the harvest and they would put them in the wine press and it would rub together, rotating around, and it would crush the grapes and the juice would come out. And then they would collect the juice and then they would strain it and then they would make, let it turn into wine or they drank it as grape juice on other occasions. And so he was crushed because of our iniquities. He went through the, the blood crushing process of God not because he was guilty but he had to be the innocent dying for the guilty and so he was per placed in the wine press of God because of that and then he says punishment for our peace was on him now he's not talking about peace with each other our, our peace we had no peace with God no fellowship with God and so God punished him in our place to give us a peaceful relationship back to God, a peaceful way. And that's such a wonderful thing for that servant of the Lord who we all know today is Jesus Christ who have done. He was pierced for us. He was punished for us. And by him, we are able to come back to God. And then he adds this last statement, and we are healed by his wounds. You see, in all actuality, it should have been me and you and all of us on the earth being placed on crosses and killed because we were all rebellious and sinful. But Jesus came and died in our place, and by the beating of the, that he had taken when he went to the cross and by the stripes on his back, our diseases are healed. So God heals us. God restores peace to us. God brings us into relationship with him all because of what he did to his son here on the cross. And I'd like to add one last statement. The Jews and the Romans did not kill Christ. God killed Christ. And the reason God did that was because our sins were placed upon him and he took the punishment and the burden for all of our sins upon him and in his body and now we can have peace with God. And that's the truth. So church, never think they killed him. He laid down his life because before they ever came around to break his legs, he said, Father, into my, your hands I commend my spirit. And they gave up his spirit. He died for us. He wasn't killed for us. But he did give his life for us. And then he says... And we all went astray like sheep. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. Now, the thing we have to understand is this. No one else was able to do this but the servant. Why? Because we all had gone astray like sheep. Every man has gone his own way. Every man does what he thinks is right. Every man does what he wants to do in the flesh. Therefore, there was no one on the earth worthy to die for us because we all had gone astray. Like sheep, if the shepherd doesn't keep the sheep and keep them rounded up and watch over them, they will just scatter and they'll go astray. And that's what we had done. And, so, and then God says, we have all turned to our own way. We lost our way in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam surrendered to, to Satan and did what God told him not to do and rebelled against God, Adam chose his own way. And man has been doing that ever since. There's never been anybody who has from birth to death except Jesus Christ done what God wants them to do. And we all have gone astray, and we all have turned to our own way. And then he says, and the Lord has punished him. Not me, not you, 
not somebody else, but the Lord has punished him, the servant, for the iniquity of us all. God put on Christ, when Christ was hanging on the cross, God put all of the iniquity and the sin from every single one of us and laid it on Jesus Christ while he is hanging on that cross. And he took the punishment for us and he went through all of the, the things that he went through because of our sin and our iniquity. And then he said, because, or I'm sorry, the Lord punished him. Notice that. The Romans didn't punish him. The Jews didn't punish him. God punished him and put all of our sins upon him, and he died for our sins. And I pray that you can see that today. Now, let's look at verses 7 through 9. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep silent before her shears, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment, and who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was with the rich man at his death, because he had done no violence and had, spoken, had not spoken deceitfully. So first of all, God says he was oppressed and afflicted. Despite all the injustice that he went through, he did not complain. So you see, first of all, Jesus suffered and was oppressed and afflicted by men even before he went to the cross. How many times did the Pharisees, Sadducees, Rulers of the synagogue come to Jesus and try to trap him into saying something that they could get rid of him. They were constantly after him. They never stopped. They never, never weakened in that point. They had to find a way to kill this man, and they never stopped oppressing him and hunting him all the days of his life. And he was not only oppressed, but he was afflicted. He was beaten. It wasn't enough to put him on the cross. They had to beat him before he goes. And in Isaiah 55, I believe it is, it says whenever he finally was put on the cross, you didn't even recognize him as a man. He had been so battered, so beaten, so bruised. And so, yet during all of that, he did not open his mouth. When Pilate uh, cross-examined him, Pilate was amazed that he didn't answer anything. And Pilate even asked him, Aren't you going to say anything? Don't you know I have the power of life and death over you? And Jesus said to him, you have no power except what my Father gives you. And, and so they, were, they oppressed him, they afflicted him, and yet he did not open his mouth. He, he in the next verse says, like a lamb led to the slaughter, and a silent, uh, and like a sheep silent before her shears, he opened not his mouth. Jesus never defended himself. He never tried to, to raise an army. He never tried to get a weapon. He never tried to, to cause an insurrection. He just simply came to represent God. And when the moment come of his trial and his death, the Bible speaks very plainly. He did not open his mouth in his defense. He allowed them to do because he knew he had to do the will of the Father. And he never cried out to God to help him. And then it says, he was taken away because of oppression and judgment. He was oppressed by the people, and he was judged as an innocent. Christ was not guilty of any of the things that they accused him of, the blasphemy and insurrection and all of that. But whenever they did that, they oppressed him, and they ruled him guilty even though he was innocent. Pilate knew he was innocent. Pilate said, listen, I'm going to wash my hands of this man's blood because he's innocent, and you guys are wanting to put him to death. Nevertheless, for your wall's sakes, and to keep rebellion down in the city of Jerusalem, I'm going to let you kill him. Pilate knew he was innocent. So did the Jewish leaders if they'd have followed and read their own scriptures. And Isaiah was one of the prophets they clung to. Yet when Jesus didn't come like they wanted him to come, they rejected him, judged him, and oppressed him. And then he says, 
who considered his fate. Nobody stopped to think, wait a minute. What we're doing here is we're, we're putting an innocent man to death. No one considered what that fate would be. No one even worried about it. It didn't matter to them who Jesus was, what Jesus had did, how many people he had healed, how many people he had raised from the dead. It, they only had one thought in mind. We need to get rid of this guy. We need to kill him. And so they never considered what they were even doing when they killed him. I think deep in their hearts, they probably knew he was special from God, but he was not the special one they wanted. And so they didn't even consider his fate. Then it says he was cut off from the land of the living. He died. Jesus died on the cross. Absolutely, he died on the cross. He was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. The people of God, Israel, had been rebelling against him all those years. Ever since they had come into the promised land, they had rebelled time and time and time and time again after God. You see, that's because men can never govern themselves or their lives or their emotions or anything. People, men cannot judge. Men cannot rule and rule correctly and rightly. But Jesus came and they, and he took our place on the cross because of our rebellion and because of his people's rebellion. And then it says, he was assigned a grave with the wicked. He was buried just like wicked people. There were two thieves who died with him that had both been wicked, although one died saved when he cried out to, cross, to, to Christ on the cross, but he was buried in a tomb just like all of the wicked, all of the rebellious, like everyone in the world. And so he was made his grave among the wicked, yet it was a rich man's grave. Jesus didn't even own a grave. Jesus was buried by a Josephus, and Josephus gave him his tomb that he had had made because he believed in Jesus. And so he allowed Jesus to be placed in his own tomb. And so he was buried in a rich man's tomb among all the wicked that are in their graves at that time. And then it says, because he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. Wow. Wow. Why did the rich man speak up and ask for the body of Jesus? Right here. He had done no violence, and he had not spoken deceitfully. Jesus had always told the truth. Now, there were times Jesus' sayings were hard, but they were always truthful. And he never did anything violently, but he did things in righteous judgment, such as drive people out of the temple in Jerusalem. And so he had done no violence, and he had not spoken deceitfully. Now, you've got to remember, Isaiah's writing all of this at least 500 years before the birth of Christ. And this is what he's saying about that servant who would come. And then in verses 10 through 12, he says, Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him, when you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed, he will prolong his days, and by his hand the Lord's pleasure, pleasure will be accomplished. After his anguish, he will see light and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him the many as a portion, and he will receive the mighty as spoil, because he willingly submitted to death and was counted among the rebels. Yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. This last section is a little long, but it's got so much to say. First of all, it says that it pleased God to crush him severely. Why would the death of his son on the cross please God? Well, the reason was because God knew by that death, many millions of the earth would eventually be saved. And because of that, God was happy. God was so wonderfully pleased to take all of our sins and place them on the body of Jesus Christ and let him die for our sins. There was no other way. And it pleased God that, it, that Christ was willing to come and be that servant and be that Messiah and be that crucified one that would carry out the plan of God. So God was pleased to crush him. 
And then it says, when you make him a guilt offering. Now in the Old Testament, they had what was called a guilt offering. And it was an offering for when you realized you had sinned. And the reason it was called the guilt offering is because you might have done something and you didn't realize it. That was a sin. And then down through the week or several days later, your conscience would start bothering you and you would feel guilty over what you had done. And that guilt would keep building in you. And so then you would have to take a sacrifice and go down to the uh, temple, to the priest, and you would have to have that sacrifice offered for you for God to remove that guilt so that you would not be guilty of doing something wrong. Even if it was accidental or on purpose, you had, and when your conscience bothered you, you had to offer up a guilt offering. So Jesus became a guilt offering we made him a guilt offering for us. And we did not do that knowingly, but he became our guilt offering. Later, when people begin to think about it and begin to understand what that death meant, and they would feel guilty because of what Christ had done for them, he was their very guilt offering to get rid of the guilt. And then he says, and he will see his seed. Now, Jesus wasn't married. Jesus had no children. How will he see his seed? Simply this. He will prolong his days. That's talking about resurrection. They killed him. They put him in the tomb, or they thought they had killed him, and they put him in the tomb. And three days later, he raised from the dead, and, and there was a resurrection. And so after, because of that, ever since that event, Jesus has been at the right hand of the Father, interceding for all of those who are, were guilty of his death and have sinned, and therefore Jesus now has many seeds. And so he also says he will see his seed and he will prolong his days. Jesus is alive forevermore and his days are going to be prolonged. And then it says, and by his hand, the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. By Jesus, God is pleased with the outcome of the death of Jesus on the cross because it's going to lead to the salvation of millions and millions of people and that's pleasurable to God. And Jesus has done the Lord's pleasure. And then it says, after his anguish, he will see light and be satisfied. Jesus, after he went through the cross, he saw the light of day again and he saw the light of God again because he resurrected from the dead and came back to life. No one else has ever done that. Jesus raised three people from the dead when he was on the earth but he, they raised with natural bodies to die again. Jesus raised with a resurrected body. And therefore he saw the light of God because he's now with God in God's presence. And he is there interceding for us. And it says when he sees that, he will be satisfied. Jesus will look back at the cross and is already looking back at the cross saying, It was worth it. I'm satisfied with the job that I did. God is using it to bring millions to him. And then it says, by his knowledge, many righteous servants will, will justify, or I'm sorry, my righteous servant will justify many. So it says, first of all, by his knowledge, knowing why he came, what he came for, and everything about it and understanding it completely, Jesus Christ will justify many. How's he going to justify many? Because we, have, we are told in our New Testaments that if we will believe in our hearts that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that he died for our sins and raised again to justify us, we too will be saved. And because of that, we are justified in the sight of God, and we are one among the many. And then it says, and he will carry their iniquities. He will remove our sins. Now, now, people, this is so important. How long did God forgive you of sin when he saved you? Well, we all know the Bible says he, get, he forgives all sin. So he forgives you of your past sin, your present sin. But he also forgives you of your future sin. Jesus Christ, by the death of the cross, keeps us sinless before God at all times, even when we sin. Now that's hard to understand. And a lot of people just won't believe that. I don't believe that can happen. Well, let me tell you, it does happen if you're saved. 
you are constantly clean. And so it says, he will carry their iniquities. He will remove their sin. Therefore, because of what Christ has done, God says, I will give him the many as a portion. Many people are going to come to God because of Christ. And in the new heaven and the new earth and all the new things to come, Christ is going to be the one that has caused the many to come. And because of that, he will rule over the many because he saved us all from our sins. And then he says, and he will receive the mighty as a spoil. Those who fought against him, those who despised him, rejected him, hated him, wanted to kill him, they will be like the spoil of war. And I'm sorry to say that there will be many people in hell because they will be the spoil of Jesus Christ because he won the battle at the cross of Calvary when he raised also from the dead. And so he will receive the mighty. He will inherit a large portion, and the mighty will be as a spoil before him. And then it says he willingly submitted to death. Wow. Jesus himself said while he hung on the cross, do you not think that I could call my father and he'd send a legion of angels? Now, a legion of angels is 144,000, if I remember my math correctly. But Jesus didn't do that. The only time Jesus cried out on the cross is when God turned his back on him and poured all of our sins on him and into him. And Jesus said, God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's the only time we ever hear of Jesus crying out. And then he says, he was counted among the willing, the, the rebels, I mean, I'm sorry. He was willing to die, and he was counted as a rebel. He was counted as a blasphemous. He was counted as one who was guilty of treason. He was counted, of, uh, counted guilty of one who had cursed God and all of those things, and yet he died willingly, and he was counted among the rebels. They even put a sign over his cross that said, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. And they did all of those things to him. And it's, he was counted among the, re the rebels. Yet look at our last sentence. Yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. The very people that Jesus was being put to death by were the very people that he came to save. That's why on the cross you hear Jesus say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This is a picture of the death of the cross of Calvary. This is a picture of Jesus dying for the sin of the world. This is a picture 500 years before he was born of what the servant would do when he came. It's a wonderful lesson. Thank God for the cross. Because of the cross we are saved. Let's pray. Our Father, Lord, we are so inadequate today to give you praise, honor, and glory, and thanks for all that you accomplished for us through the death of your servant, Jesus Christ. Lord, we realize that even today we were not worthy and are not worthy of him dying for us. And yet, Lord, you struck him, you, you, struck, you submitted him to the wine press of God, you, you put him in the stressful situation, you hung him on a cross and you killed him and allowed him to die that we might have life eternal with you. Lord, I don't know how to say thank you enough for that. But I praise your name and I praise your love and I praise your goodness and I praise you, Lord Jesus, for being willing to come and to die on the cross that we might be saved. Father, forgive us our own sins of this day and help us to walk worthy of being called by your name. And on that great and noble day when you return to get your people, may you find us willing, able, looking up, and ready to meet you in the air and that we shall forever be with the Lord. Oh God, thank you for your love. Thank you for loving us that much. And thank you, Jesus, for being our place. And thank you for taking our place on the cross of Calvary. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Well, thank you for being with us again today. I hope that you have learned something from in the lesson. I pray that God will keep his hand upon you and bless you and use you and that you'll join us again next week. Until then, may God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.